all this and more with me, Alison LaGrange, at these times, only on Leon E-Club. Hello everyone and welcome to the India story. I'm Vikram Chandra and this is of course the show that takes a look at all that's happening in India and interprets it for a global audience. And I'm going to start off by taking a look at a very interesting bill that has just come in the state of Uttarakhand, the Uniform Civil Code. Now this has sparked considerable debate and for two reasons. One is the broader question of a uniform civil code at all. It's been a controversial issue for many, many years. What's going to happen with uniform civil codes or not? Will it be rolling out all across the country? Will it not? Should it be done or should it not? But I'm going to park that particular debate for a little later. Because today, I'm going to be talking about one specific provision in the Uttarakhand Uniform Civil Code. And that is the clause around live-in couples. That's a mandate. A mandate that live-in couples have to register their relationship within one month or face strict punishment, including prison, including a jail sentence. If you're living with somebody and you don't register it, you could go to jail. But obviously questions are being asked about the feasibility of such enforcement by the state and the entire question of privacy. How will authorities handle situations where individuals are roommates, for example, but not romantically involved? What if the couple breaks up? So lots of questions to ask. And we're going to get a couple of really uh, special guests to help answer some of those questions. Senior Supreme Court Advocate Karuna Nandi and gender rights activist Deepika Narayan Bhardwaj both will be joining us to discuss that clause of the UCC bill. But also on the show, a really dramatic election in Pakistan. Dramatic, not just because of the fact that there was an election, but because of the turnout and because of what the early results and the early leads and indication threw up. Now, we're still waiting to see what the full implications are going to be of the elections and what the final outcome will be. But what should India be doing and what does it all mean for India? Foreign Policy Commentator Indrani Bagche is going to be joining us to tell us. And we're going to end the show by taking a look at the Indian Cricket's Yorker King, Jaspreet Bumrah, who's of course been scripting history for quite some time, but the first Indian pacer to climb to the top of the ICC Test Bowling Rankings. We're going to be talking to a cricket writer and veteran sports journalist, Pradeep Magazine, on whether Bumrah is on the road of becoming India's greatest fast bowler. And I know there are some contenders out there, but we're going to be talking to that to him about that. All of this and much more coming up on the show. But first, a quick look at the major headlines. India's External Affairs Ministry spokesperson Randhir Jaiswal on February 8th doused fire on claims that India origin students were being targeted in the United States. The MEA representative said that the five killings reported this year were not interconnected. He also said that the MEA is actively collaborating with local authorities, consulates and missions to provide support to the affected families. India has firmly dismissed accusations of meddling in Canadian elections as baseless. External Affairs Ministry spokesperson Randhir Jaiswal on February 8 emphasized that the real concern lies in Ottawa's interference in New Delhi's internal affairs. India's reaction came after reports from Canadian media indicated that the country's top federal agency is investigating alleged Indian meddling in the past two general elections. 
India has suspended the free movement regime with Myanmar and the government is in the process of scrapping it. This was confirmed by Home Minister Amit Shah this week. Taking to social media X, Shah said that the agreement is being called off to protect the internal security of the country amid concerns that militants and trans-border criminals are misusing the regime to smuggle weapons and fake currency and take refuge. Legislators from Kerala and Tamil Nadu protested in Delhi against the alleged discrimination in the allocation of funds by the center. Three southern states, including Karnataka, have claimed injustice in devolution of taxes and other grants. Kerala Chief Minister Pinyari Vijayan and members of his left Democratic Front government marched to the Jantar Mantar in central Delhi. Tamil Nadu MPs of the ruling DMK and its alliance partners protested near the Mahatma Gandhi statue in the parliament complex. Indian music struck a chord at the 2024 Grammy Awards with five Indian musicians including tabla maestro Sakir Hussain and flautist Rakesh Charasia, picking up the coveted prize at a glittering ceremony in Los Angeles while Hussein was India's big winner with three Grammys. All right, let's start by taking a look at Uttarakhand's new uniform civil code. And, I, and as I started by saying, there are broader questions around the uniform civil code. It's been a contentious provision for a long period of time. This was, remember, one of the BJP's three key items on its agenda, the Ram Temple, scrapping Article 370 and a uniform civil code. Now, Article 370 has already been scrapped. The Ram Temple is up there. We saw the Pran Pratishtha a short while back, which is why many people are feeling that maybe the BJP is now going to be turning its attention to the uniform civil code. Maybe after elections, maybe Modi 3.0, that's what the BJP is going to, going to try and introduce. And we'll have to wait for some time to see whether that does happen or doesn't happen. But we'll park that for the moment. So setting the uniform civil code around, there are other aspects that I'm still trying to wrap my, my head around. Some aspects I'm trying to wrap my head around when it comes to Uttarakhand's new uniform civil code. And in particular, the live-in provision. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. You see, the law makes it compulsory now in Uttarakhand for a couple living together to register their relationship. According to the legislation, individuals in or planning to enter live-in relations will have to register themselves with district officials within a month, failing which they risk facing a jail term of three to six months and a fine of up to 25,000. Now, at a time when the government is really talking about decriminalization, it's touting the Jan Vishwas bill, talking about how it decriminalizes offenses and improves the ease of living, Uttarakhand wants to send people to jail over their relationships if they do not register them with the state. Now, the state government argues that the provision would essentially legitimize living relationships and give rights to both parties. So. Let's look at a relationship that's already considered legitimate, marriage. Now in India, a majority of marriages are actually officiated through traditional customs like phere or in other religions, nikka, anand karaj or vows in a church. Now, they're not actually documented always with the marriage registrar's office. So certainly there's no criminalization around this, whether it happens or it doesn't happen. The government doesn't often have a record of who was married and who was not married. The UCC does, of course, push for marriage registrations by deeming couples ineligible for benefits, government benefits, unless they do so. Still, Uttarakhand seems to be more keen to keep records and a tight vigil on relationships outside wedlock by threatening jail in these cases. Another provision that some would consider bizarre makes the declaration of a live-in relationship subject to a registrar's inquiry and approval. This is a legal hurdle. Marriage couples don't have to jump through. If you want to marry somebody, you marry them. You don't have to go to a government official and saying, hey, I'm planning to marry this person. Can you inquire and give me your approval because I want to marry this person? But in a living relationship in Uttarakhand, 
It apparently is going to happen. So how will the Uttarakhand government implement such a law? Let's just look at some scenarios. Let's say there's a couple. It is not registered. They, they live in relationship. They claim they're roommates. Now, how do the officials prove otherwise? Do agencies raid bedrooms in the middle of the night to see what's actually going on? Are they living together or are they just roommates, you know, watching TV or something like that? Consider other situations. Consider two people living together in a house, sharing rent. Now, one night they get drunk. They get up to some mischief, you know, whatever. Do they now have to file official government paperwork over that one incident and from that point onwards, should they be considered that they are living in or should you not? And, and there are other provisions in this that are leaving me sort of somewhat baffled as to how it's all going to work out. According to Uttarakhand UCC, for example, the mandatory registration of live-in relations extends to residents of Uttarakhand in a live-in relationship even outside the state. How is this going to be policed? I mean, are you going to have the Dehradun police going door to door in cities like Mumbai and Gurgaon and Bengaluru and Hyderabad and saying, hey, you're a, you're a domiciled in Uttarakhand, whom are you living in with and have you registered it or have you not registered this? Conducting midnight raids in bedrooms all across the country. How is this going to work? Has somebody really thought some of this through? Uh, other questions, what about hostels and dormitories? There are schools and colleges in Uttarakhand. There are schools in Dehradun. Hey, I started in a school in Dehradun once upon a time. What is the government going to do? Are they going to keep track of student activities in schools and colleges? What's actually happening in those dorms out there? If they are roommates in a college dormitory or they are roommates in a school and they get up to mischief, should that be considered a live-in relationship? Again, something that has to be thought through. Also, People under the age of 21, they need parental consent to register a live-in relationship. What happens if the parent does not con consent? Will the government send officers then to stand guard at hostels to ensure that the couple stay apart? Or will the students be forced to move out of the hostel or will they just be arrested? I think it's important to get into these details because when some of these laws and regulations are brought in, it's important to think this through. Otherwise, it just becomes either a law that is not actually being implemented or it becomes a law that becomes the focus of rent seeking. Officials will just come and harass people, get money out of them and that's all that will happen. It's exactly what the issues were when it came to section 377 some time back. It's not that it was actually being implemented and people were being sent to prison, but it became the grounds for harassment. It became the grounds for the encroachment into individual rights and civil liberties and none of them were right and that's the reason why so many people went it went by uh, were speaking out against section 377 and eventually it was repealed and that was good so therefore if new things are happening which could start that entire cycle happening again we need to think about it a little bit and talking of section 377 what about the lgbtq community remember the Supreme Court read down Section 377 to decriminalize sexual activity between people of the same gender. Now, the law no longer holds homosexual activity to be an unnatural offense which is against the order of nature, so it has been decriminalized. However, the Uttarakhand legislation makes no provision for same-sex couples. It says live-in relationships will not be registered in cases that are against public policy and morality. Uh, what exactly does that mean? Same-sex couples, can they live together or can they not live together? Does living together mean that they have to register it, otherwise they're going to risk going to jail and can they register it? Or is the state going to just ignore their existence? All of this needs to be thought through. And finally, in this particular clause, you can't just break up. If you're living together, you can't just break up. Now, of course, you can't just break up in a marriage also. You have to go through divorce proceedings. But here in this living relationship, the civil code has a termination clause that requires a couple to submit a written statement in a prescribed format which may invite a police investigation if the reasons cited seem suspicious. Uh, I'm just going to say that again in case you think that that's somewhat baffling. It is. 
if you are in a living relationship and you want to break up, you got to tell the police about it and say we are breaking up. And it is then for the police to decide whether the reasons cited are suspicious or if they are not. If you are arguing, if you dislike each other, if you are fighting about money, whatever is happening in your private personal life. And I think that is the reason I am going on talking about this because this should technically be the private personal life of people. But if the police don't like the reasons that you have given for breaking up, they can launch an investigation. Well, actually divorce somewhat sounds simpler. Actually marriage sounds somewhat simpler. And perhaps that's exactly what the government is trying to achieve in the long term. Making live-in relationships in Uttarakhand so complicated, the couples would rather just get married. Uh, that may be where we are headed, but a big question is, is this what is going to happen across the country? It's Uttarakhand right now, we're raising all of these questions, but are we going to see this in other parts of the country as well? It is certainly worth debating, and that's exactly what we're going to do right now. We're now being joined by Senior Supreme Court Advocate Karuna Nandi and by gender rights activist Deepika Narayan Bhardwaj. Ms. Nandi, why don't I start with you? You know, whatever the merits and demerits of this particular clause are, I, I guess the first thing which we have to wrap our head around is how is it actually going to be enforced? Are you going to have the policemen walking into people's houses in the middle of the night to see are you roommates or are you living together? And what exactly are you doing? Is that how it's going to actually operate on the ground? You know, what's interesting is um, that when there were provisions in the U.S. banning uh, homosexual sex, that it was on this issue, the fact that the police can't come into your house and decide what you're doing on the grounds of privacy. That was one of the major grounds on which the law was struck down. So in this country, of course, we have a very robust right to privacy. There is Puttaswami. Um, and what that says, uh, and it's a nine judge bench, and what that says, the Supreme Court says, that there is no question of intimate decision making being interfered with by the state, whether it's on the grounds of honor, and they say so explicitly, or whether it's on any other ground. Um, of course, this is underpinned always, because when we speak of intimate decision making, we speak of the ability of the individual person to make decisions. So obviously, this is based on consent, it is based on bodily autonomy, it is based on all of these um, factors, all of these freedoms that every individual um, carries with them, regardless of who they are and where they are. So when it comes to marital rape, for example, or when it comes to, you know, then people say that, oh, but why should law be in the bedroom? Um, you cannot have, privacy ends where bodily autonomy begins, you see? So you can't kill your wife in the bedroom. You can't molest your wife in the bedroom. So therefore you also, you know, can't rape your wife in the bedroom. All right, Ms. Bhatvaj, let me get your overall perception of this living clause. Um, how is it going to be managed is the question all of us are asking. Uh, um, you know, what does it also mean for privacy? What, for example, if your roommate's deciding to sleep together, what if your roommate's not living together, but one night you get drunk and get up to mischief from now onwards, are you in a living relationship? Uh, and also, more specifically, the question of criminalization, which I think is the real issue here. Uh, Vikram, uh, at the outset, I think uh, I... I uh, uh, agree to what uh, Ms. Nandi said. Um, I, I don't know how this is going to be regulated. Two individuals who are adults can decide about their life, whether they want to live for how long they want to live together and if they want to move out. The essence of a live-in relationship is that two people are coming together because they do not want to get uh, go through the rigmaroles of um, a married institution. Uh, they, there's no certain commitment as such, but they're exploring uh, whether they want to live a their life together for a longer time or not. It may turn into a marriage or it may not turn into a marriage. It's it's essentially called a live-in, live-out relationship. Uh, this is essentially comes from the West, in my understanding, but uh, over there, whenever wherever live-in relationships are legalized, uh, I tried to read, but there aren't uh, regulations the way we are bringing it in the in India. And, you know, Ms. Badda, I've had some people saying that the way it is worded, it's almost, I don't know, simpler to get married and divorced than it is to actually be in a living relationship now. Because 
if you're breaking up, for example, you don't necessarily have the police coming and doing an investigation and the possibility of being thrown into prison if you're doing something wrong. Uh, well, I, I kind of sort of disagree with you on that. If a marriage breaks down, uh, you have to go through a divorce and that's a longer procedure as well. Here you can move out, but then, uh, then there are repercussions only for the uh, man because he has to pay maintenance to the, to the woman he was in live-in relationship uh, with. The law says if he deserts her. If you have not registered the uh, live-in relationship, there are, of course, criminal provisions. Uh, but like you said, yes, if you do not register a marriage under the UCC in Uttarakhand, there is, I think, only um, fine. So it's definitely tough. More, more than that, uh, Vikram, it's going to really, really uh, he bring hesitation in people if they really want to get into a live-in relationship. The whole concept of live-in relationship was that you're making an individual choice. Your parents do not necessarily need to be involved in that. But here you are bringing registration process. Uh, it is mandatory. Ms. Dandi, do you think this live-in clause is going to be challenged in any way? And you said at the Supreme Court, for example, there are already rulings on privacy. It could be challenged on that. Could it be on the grounds of fundamental liberties and fundamental rights and the question of criminalization? Where do you see this headed? It could be challenged on a variety of grounds. It's not just on the grounds of privacy. It's also on the grounds of freedom, you know. So what I, what a person does with their body is really their own decision as long as it's consensual, right? Um, so that is something that is increasingly underpinning laws concerning these a variety of relationships. Um, Joseph Shine, of course, the uh, where the adultery provision was struck down is something that this the current dispensation has sought to bring back in the Bharti Nyaya Sanita. Um, but also with a variety of other uh, intimate issues. But there's something that also I think the framers must know, which is that if they are seeking to protect the woman with regard to maintenance, actually the domestic uh, violence laws already apply. The civil laws, as they should be, they say that if you live in a shared household, together and if there is violence so of you know a variety of, of in a variety of ways then you can get the benefit of a share of, of a, a right to residence you can get maintenance you can get a variety of things so therefore this law is entirely misguided uh, also what was somewhat amusing for me is that they seem to have brought in unwittingly perhaps, uh, a recognition of live-in relationships by queer couples. Because the law says whosoever, they, it doesn't say man and woman, right? There's one place where it says S slash he, but it doesn't make clear that it has to be two people of the opposite sex. So frankly, if they took away the um, <clears throat> criminal provision, the criminalization of it, and they made it something like a civil partnership and included anyone who wanted to be in a civil partnership, that would be a very correct and progressive thing to do. That does not appear to be what they are, in fact, doing, though. Well, Bhagavad, that, that was an interesting perspective. So, you know, if the intention is to actually protect people who are in a live-in relationship, and let's give the benefit of the doubt to the Uttarakhand government and say, look, all they're trying to do is there should be some maintenance, there should be some rights, there should be some protection for people in a live-in relationship. Now, if that's the intention, then it's not that difficult to change this a little bit so that you keep the good and throw away the bad. You should just decriminalize it, for example, not make it compulsory or mandatory, say that this is an option that is given to people in driven relationship, that they can register it and then X, Y, Z benefits flow from that. That's the logical, simple way to, way to take it forward. Uh, Vikram, I personally feel there has to be a framework somewhere, some rules definitely define and make things better in any society. Live-in relationships are a growing reality in India and across the world. There are certain frameworks uh, within the civil laws uh, to, you know, sort of rule these relationships. So till, till that place, it is fine. I think non-registration and having that criminalized is something that is definitely questionable. Uh, second thing is, of course, uh, violation of right to privacy. Of course, we'll have to see if this gets challenged, what the court says. Something that I personally, with the cases that I deal uh, on a daily basis, the, what I feel um, uh, what has happened is going to be good um, at a larger level is that there were a lot of 
rape allegations that were coming out of live-in relationships where the woman said that the man had promised to marry her uh he is not marrying her and she ended up charging him with rape if there is a registration then at least uh such kind of allegations yeah. would not be made out because you are willingly submitting to a live-in relationship all right ms nandi a last quick word from you it's very possible that ucc is going to start rolling out in other states and and you know maybe after the elections across the country do you think this sort of a provision is going to be there then in the ucc elsewhere as well i hope not it's hard to tell this is a particularly egregious provision which is why everyone is talking about it but also i think there was a missed opportunity by the supreme court in the uh, queer marriage in the marriage equality case because one of the challenges was to the special marriage act notice provision right which is that you have to put a notice um saying if you are an interfaith or intercaste um uh, etc couple which is typically the uh, kinds of couples that get married under the married under the special marriage act to see that to say that you intend to get married that was argued by one side but that was not unfortunately decided by the court right now this is actually a similar provision which is that if you are just living together say your family doesn't want you to get married and you say okay i'm a little hesitant to get married without my family's approval so i'm going to live together on pain of criminal penalty you have to register that living together then the impact on vigilante groups is going to be very significant you know um in terms of legitimizing that and given also the rise of the uh, the the legislations prohibiting interfaith marriages um then somewhere in the mind of the executing police officer there is the idea that oh this is illegal anyway and what the vigilante groups is only uh, uh, are doing is only enforcing the law right yeah. in the all of it is very fuzzy thinking so there is a huge danger there and this provision i really hope it goes all right uh, uh, ms nandi ms badwa thank you both so much for for being with us you know a, a really interesting a uh, provision i guess interesting is the word in the uttarakhand ucc let's see where it actually goes i mean ho- hopefully it will not be taken to those worst extents of policemen gunning around knocking down people's doors not just in uttarakhand but all over the country saying what exactly is happening in your bedroom are you sleeping together or are you not Let- let's hope it doesn't come to that and let's hope that better wisdom prevails that as we've been discussing there are very simple ways in which this could become an enabling provision which gives rights to people without actually impinging either privacy or having criminalization that would be the logical way to go but let's see where we actually end up on that particular point and that's uh, the perfect moment for me to then turn my attention to the other big story that we've been tracking which could have a major implication for india and i'm talking about pakistan right now what's been happening in pakistan for the last couple of days is really really interesting and i'll give you a little bit of the back story to that everyone thought that the elections in pakistan this time were going to be a complete farce and the build up was obviously a complete farce here you have imran khan the leader of the pti and there are three sentences imposed on him with weeks to go for uh, the election you know 7 years 10 years 14 years his wife also being sent to prison his number 2 being sent to prison a number of pti leaders uh, defecting just because they couldn't take the pressure anymore um, it was looking like a complete farce of an election a selection which would just have the coronation if you like of nawaz sharif or whoever the army wanted as the prime minister of pakistan but then the script changed a little bit and it changed in a rather dramatic manner because first of all when the elections actually took place we saw these images there were long queues a large number of people turned out to vote and they turned out to vote in circumstances that continued to of course not be what you would expect in a free and fair election you had the internet being switched off in large parts of the country you saw long queues you saw procedural delays that people felt were a way of timing uh, a free and fair election from taking place uh, all sorts of conspiracy theories were being circulated about the fact that the internet was off and people could not connect on their mobile phones but despite all of that people turned out to vote and they voted in very large numbers and then after that something happened 
that was even more interesting. You had the PTI, Imran Khan's party. And remember, the PTI lost his election symbol. It couldn't actually contest. A large number of independents were contesting who were affiliated to Imran Khan. And when the first results started to come out, they were winning. They were well in the lead. Now, of course, what follows after that remains shrouded in mystery, in confusion, and it's not quite clear what the final form of the government will be. Or, if I use the correct words, what the final form of the government will be allowed to be by the Pakistani army but by the, and by the Pakistani state. But whatever happens, you have to say that the denouement was a surprise and it was interesting. And for people watching those elections in India, it did open a lot of questions. What exactly is happening here and how should India react to this? And for more on that, we're now being joined by Indrani Bakshi, the CEO of the Ananta Aspen Center and one of the country's top foreign policy and strategic thinkers. Indrani, I mean, look, whatever finally happens, when all the dust settles, when the government is finally sworn in with whatever powers it's got, I have to say, your jaw must have been, uh, I don't know, falling open when those early results were coming in. I mean, my God, what was that? Oh my God! I, I, uh, we were. I was up half of last night, uh, uh, just uh, watching the the trends coming in. Uh, now, uh, uh, Imran Khan is in jail. Imran Khan's party doesn't actually officially exist. His uh, uh, people are contesting as independents and winning. The trends that uh, that we saw last, at least till. Uh, till late last night and early this morning was about over 150 uh, seats where uh, PTI members as independent candidates were uh, leading. Um, in fact, at one point last night, I saw Nawaz Sharif was trailing in both his constituencies in Lahore and Mansera. Um, but um, so, yeah, that was, I mean, it's it's unbelievable because we were, until day before yesterday, we were uh, convinced that we knew what the outcome was. I mean, look, is there any clear health warning and everything that we say that who knows, whatever finally, finally happens by the time everything is decided, no one knows what the final, final picture is going to be. There could always be a coup after a coup, who knows. Um, Army may well want to have things its own way, as it always does. But that having been said, it clearly showed that, you know, elections in a sense are a scary business if you're the Pakistani army because they've tried everything they could. They sent, you know, Imran Khan to more than 20 years in prison. They arrested his key lieutenants, party broken up, not having a, sim a symbol. But still people came out and they voted and they seem to have voted in a manner that the establishment may not have liked. So, you know, whatever the dominance of the Pakistani army that we keep talking about, do you think? some questions around that right now that uh, need to be kept in mind, especially when other people interact and deal with Pakistan? Is it as dominant as everyone once thought it was? Indeed, indeed. And in fact, uh, this uh, the, the sort of diminishing of the Pakistan army, if you wish, has been underway for the last few years. You have seen, uh, even with uh, General Bajwa in power, uh, you uh, the that people have been pushing back, that terror groups that worked under the army and the ISI no longer uh, are not always following the diktat. Uh, they expected Taliban, uh, whom they had nurtured for decades, to deliver on the Tehrike, on the Tehrike Taliban, which is the TTP. They didn't. Uh, the Taliban, in fact, are the, uh, the Pakistan army is now engaged in conflict with the Taliban Afghanistan, uh, something that we had not even considered uh, when in on 15th of August 2021, when the U.S. left, uh, the, the same Imran Khan was celebrating uh, it as uh, losing the shackles of slavery. Within three years, Pakistan Army, Pakistan Security Forces are at war with the Taliban. Mm. In KPK, in Balochistan, in Balochistan, the results, whatever they may be, but the trends on the ground are very, very different. 
All right, Indrani. So let's now look at this from a policy point of view and from the point of view of countries like India or the rest of the world for that matter who try to figure out how do we deal with Pakistan. Now, till now, there's always been this big question. Whom do you talk to in Pakistan? Whom should you actually have a discussion? And clearly there was a view that, well, you could talk to the elected government, but it doesn't really matter because the elected government doesn't have eventual say. It's the Pakistani army that really controls the, the, the remote control. And so talk to the army. But now... If the army also doesn't seem to have control, then it may well be a good signal for the future. But for the moment, um, there may be a vacuum that is going to exist for a period of time. So whom do you talk to? Well, most certainly. And actually, this is, a, uh, the, this is an answer or a riposte, if you will, to uh, many people in India who say that, uh, oh, you know, the army is in charge. Let's talk to the army. The, uh, it completely uh, it completely undermines any democratic project in Pakistan. Uh, and what you're seeing on the ground is literally people voting and people exercising a democratic right, however constrained that may be, however uh, undermined that may be. But they're exercising a right. And that right is very different. So for India as a dem democracy, to bypass the civilian or the elected government to say to deal only with the army would have been folly. And I'm glad we have not done it. And I'm hoping that we will not do it. Indrani, were the elections free and fair? Obviously, big question marks about it. Was there an attempt to try and influence the result? Obviously, that's also crystal clear from multiple things that we've seen. But the way the people then came out to vote, the turnout that we saw, and if the early trends were anything to go by, then the way they seem to have voted. Do you think there's a, there's a gesture of defiance in all of this from the people of Pakistan to the establishment, perhaps even to the Pakistani army, that really has taken everyone by surprise? Correct. I 100%. And it, it, it throws up interesting questions for India, as you rightly said, uh, about India's how should India deal with Pakistan going forward? Uh, we have maintained, I mean, since August 5, 2019, there's been a sense of kind of benign neglect. Uh, Pakistan throughout uh, the Indian High Commissioner and uh, relations, diplomatic relations were downgraded. But uh, in 2021, the two uh, armies actually worked out a security uh, a ceasefire deal which has held even to date it holds uh, so there my my best answer to this is that as long as india does not become a factor in the domestic politics in pakistan we will be fine and Rani, one other question, uh, Nawaz Sharif, when he came back to Pakistan, there was a lot of attention here in India about the fact that, oh, he's talking about peace to India. So, okay, he's going to be the selected candidate, the selected prime minister by the army and the establishment, but maybe that opens up certain windows for peace. So should you talk to Pakistan at some point, and maybe Nawaz Sharif is a good person to talk to, at least there was a debate that had started out here. Now, even if Nawaz Sharif is the person who's eventually crowned the prime minister in some form or the other, would it be a tainted victory because of all the things that we have seen around the election? And therefore, should India be talking to him or perhaps just sit back and wait and see how things actually pan out over a longer period of time? Oh, absolutely. It will be a tainted victory. There will be, depending on which scenario they go with, uh, and there are several possibilities on the ground right now, but uh, depending on how how the next government shapes up, it will it is a fragile victory. It will be fragile. It will be unstable. But also, you know, Nawaz cannot actually go away from or step away from a position that Imran took, which is that you have to reverse. Uh, India has to reverse three hundred and seventy abrogation to be able to get back to talks with Pakistan. I don't see how Nawaz is going to. Indrani Bhakti, thank you so much for joining us with that perspective. And let's turn our attention now to what the global media has been saying about India. This is, of course, our regular segment that we do every single week. The BBC had an interesting piece on that 
Living clause in the UCC in Uttarakhand. The BBC remarking that the notion of counting and registering living couples is a bit peculiar in a country that, according to the BBC, uh, hasn't conducted a population census in a long time since 2011. The BBC also saying that the implementation of the new law could discourage cohabiting couples and aid landlords to hesitate in renting to unregistered couples. We had an interesting piece in the Japan Times about tigers saying that tigers in India are increasingly being spotted at higher altitudes. Uh, Japan Times says that this is a shift attributed to climate change and to human activity. Japan Times saying that according to the report, the Wildlife Institute of India has found tigers in Sikkim's mountains previously unseen for animals. And this of course trends with global observations of species shifting to high altitudes as temperatures rise. Finally, Al Jazeera had a report uh, talking about the uh, human rights group Amnesty International calling for an end to the demolition of Muslim properties in India, saying it is a form of extrajudicial punishment. And let's now shift our focus to cricket and on a question that's been animating the entire cricketing world for the past few weeks. Is Jaspreet Bunra perhaps the finest fast bowler that India has ever produced. Well, Bumrah's ascent to the pinnacle of Test cricket this week has obviously sparked that animation. He's become the best, the number one fast bowler on the planet in Test cricket. It's a testament, of course, to his extraordinary prowess on the field, the fact that he's the only bowler to have ever achieved the number one ranking across all three formats. It just tells you about the rare talent that we are witnessing. But his achievements are not just numbers on a board. They tell a, a story of resilience, of skill, of unparalleled dedication to his craft. His test bowling average, second only to the legendary Sid Barnes for bowlers with at least 150 wickets. Now that speaks of volumes about his ability. The question, of course, is that he does face injuries. Perhaps because of that action, he faces injuries that would sideline many. But despite that, Bumrah's dominance across all formats remains unmatched. And he's just led India to a spectacular victory, a match which they may have lost if Bumrah wasn't there. And that's really continuing to get a lot of people chattering. Now look, let's not really get into the best bowler ever produced in India. There are lots of really, really great candidates, not least Kapil Dev. And you, you, there are lots of great fast bowlers who've been out there, Zahir Khan, many others. But it's interesting. India loves its cricket and has been a nation that really reveres its batting legends, be it Gavaskar or Tindulkar or even Kohli. But for long, we've really yearned, yearned and really longed for a pace bowling hero who's considered to be the best in the world. Kapil Dev was a hero, of course, best in the world, perhaps not even at its heyday. Now, enter Jaspreet Bumrah, a beacon of fast bowling across the world that breaks the mold and certainly inspires a generation. And that extends from his bowling action to his calm demeanor on the field. And for more on that, we're now being joined by Pradeep Magazine, one of the top cricketing journalists and one of the top experts we have in India, not just on cricket but all other sports of course as well. Pradeep, thank you so much for joining us. Just wanted to get a sense of the way the Indian team is looking right now. But I just want to start by Bumrah. You have been must have been seeing this debate that is he perhaps the best fast bowler that India has ever produced? Well, I think yes, given the way he's performing and uh... I think Jaspreet, not just the best fast bowler India has produced. At the moment, I think uh, he should be among the best the world has produced. You know, it's his unusual action. Despite that, his control over his uh, uh, pace, his accuracy, his movement. Above all, his, I think, uh, that cricketing sense. Uh, where to bowl, when to bowl, what to bowl, and and he never seems to lose control. It's amazing. I mean, I mean, our world hasn't seen this kind of a bowler in many years, I would say. But Pradeep, there's a side risk there, of course, which you keep worrying about when it comes to Bumrah, is that his particular action, whatever that does for his craft and for his control and the rest of it is fine. 
but it does seem to keep leaving open the possibilities of injuries that back injury he had which almost seemed career threatening at some point which means you go on worrying about workload and is there a risk that bumrah could possibly break down and have another serious injury well uh, vikram yes you are right in that you see he had to miss almost a year of uh, international cricket because of injuries and a lot of people have said over repeated it again and again that given the unusual way he bowls i mean he has a very short run up his elbow gets so much extended uh his wrist his vp wrist action he put so much of uh, effort in it that he yes looks liable to get injured but let's enjoy as long as he is <laughs> bowling so well uh, i mean many times you feel it's a miracle the way uh, his action is and the way he controls his uh, his his bowling his speeds they he varies them so yes there will always remain a concern but touchwood he's 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 at the peak of his form at the moment and and i'm sure everyone knows that everyone has seen it that if he had not been there we might have been 2-0 down in this series so pradeep would it be fair to say that that entire debate of bumrah's role place in cricket history may also end up getting affected by how many matches he actually ends up playing right what are the final wickets he gets that look at jimmy anderson whom we are seeing right now look at how long he's been playing for couple dave of course an absolute legend look at the number of of wickets he act- he actually got now in, in bumrah's case his place will be of course what he did to get to 150 200 maybe even 300 wickets is there but will he have the longevity to really take it to get those all time records because of the injury factor well you see when you see the longevity of fast bowlers the first thing you will realize bowlers who have lasted that long who have crossed 3 4 500 uh, test victims they have had actions which are very smooth very uh, there is a rhythm to it you know they you although they put in a lot of effort but the way they run towards the crease and the way their bowling action is that cartwheel action as they say of fast bowlers it, there is a rhythm to it there is an effortlessness to it which probably makes them less and less injury prone in bumrah's case yes you know that it would be difficult for him to cross those magical high uh, wicket taking marks uh but i would say that if he lasts another couple of years even or two to three more years he should cross 300 wickets but above all it's the average the average at which uh, he takes his wickets which probably would be as good or if not the best in comparison to other pace bowlers now the entire question of whether bumrah should be given more rest of course does depend on the rest of the fast bowling uh, you know lineup that we actually have now it's strange a year ago people were actually saying that look india can field two or three world class teams potentially and lots and lots of fast bowlers to choose from it's still true but if shami is not there and siraj is not there also then how do you give bumrah rest i mean mukesh kumar and others on the team i'm not sure whether they're going to really be able to fill a, a, a bumrah's boots uh, as it were so is the cupboard suddenly starting to look a little bare when it comes to fast bowlers more than it was a year year and a half ago well just suddenly you you didn't have shami and you didn't have siraj and you suddenly realized that maybe india doesn't have that kind of a bench strength in fast bowling which we probably envisaged a, a year back we yeah. thought that we have such pool of great fast bowlers and india has never seen such bunch together and we will uh, dominate uh, test cricket and suddenly in this england team has shown us very vulnerable i i, I mean you leave out bumrah i was saying earlier you take out bumrah from this team and you wonder if he would have won the second test even uh, this attacking english side has suddenly opened up possibilities of so much vulnerabilities in this indian team that you suddenly started reassessing the strengths of this team So, you know pradeep the problem is perhaps even more so when it comes to batting when you look at the batting lineup i mean you have a couple of injuries and suddenly you're starting to to struggle a little bit shreya sayer i don't know how many chances he's got how many chances he's going to keep on getting shubman gill okay he's scored a century but when you look beyond that the cupboard especially in in test cricket is starting to look a little bare you, you need to find people and bring them in and groom them for test cricket because at some point Kohli could retire and Rohit Sharma could retire and then what do you do 
Well, I think what probably is happening is that we have to, we we thought that this Indian, uh, see India is a very strong one day side. Uh, say we couldn't win the World Cup. We lost in the final, but but the way India dominated that World Cup till the final was incredible. And many people thought that that was one of the best one day sides world cricket has seen as even India has seen. But in test cricket, I think suddenly you see maybe uh, the impact of T20 cricket is visible that these batsmen are not um, have enough concentration of skills to last long, to play longer innings. They, they are good at uh, 40s, 50s, 80s, scoring very at a great uh, pace. But they are not good at when conditions are difficult, uh, not in their favor, and they have to stay at the wicket. And you suddenly feel that maybe we are seeing the impact of T20 cricket on Indian batting in Test cricket. Because I have not seen such vulnerable Indian batting in years. That also makes you realize how Virat Kohli is such an important uh, cog in this Indian batting wheel. Because he comes at number four and when the situation is not very uh, favorable, but the way the assurance with which he bats, the way he controls the uh, anchors, the innings. So su him suddenly missing, you suddenly feel a very, very vulnerable look to Indian batting, which should worry all those who feel that uh, test cricket should survive because India doing well in test cricket is very important for survival of test cricket. You know, Pradeep, to be fair, the problems with the top of the order in the batting have been there for a while. I mean, even if you look at some of those miraculous performances in test cricket that India has had, look at the, look at Gaba, look at Brisbane, what happened uh, out there at those Australian series, some of the high points of test cricket. But it wasn't actually the top order that delivered. It was Rishabh Pant, some of the lower batting orders, five, six, seven. Those were the bats who were winning India matches. So that's perhaps something else we need to think about. There is some weakness there in the top order that need to be shored up and shored up fast. Cool. Yeah, there is because you are right. When you look back at those test victories, even you realize that India were in trouble, even in batting troubles. It's the late order, the like somebody like Rishabh Pant or Washington Sundar there or. Uh, so these were the guys who made us uh, recover and fight back and even win test test a test match which we thought we had lost. So yes, that vulnerability has been there, and suddenly this England team, uh, I mean, it it has come to India. I have not seen uh, um, none of us have seen an outside team coming to India and playing, and and in fact making our spinners look uh, ordinary the way they are attacking them and exposing even them. Yes, these are worrying factors, but the good part is that we are having a fascinating series. At least it's it's not a, a dominant one side, which is like scoring huge runs and then dismissing the rival teams for good for nothing score. So, so uh, these next three test matches, we are all looking forward to it and see how they pan out. All right, Pradeep Magazine, thank you so much for joining us. Always lovely talking to you. And that's all we have time for on this episode of the India Story. I'm Vikram Chandra and I'll be back again next week with a lineup of all the big stories that are happening in India and analysts to help you understand and dissect them. But for the moment, goodbye. Global Voice, the channel that brings you the biggest stories from across the world through India's lens. Now available in more than 190 countries worldwide. Because we believe that the world is one. Watch us in Africa, Europe, USA and Canada, South America, Asia Pacific, Middle East and North African regions. Also available on these digital platforms across the world. We are World is one. This week on Tech It Out. We get you highlights from the recently concluded World Defense Show that took place in Riyadh. Meet an astronaut who has set a new record for the most time in space. And we tell you about a major breakthrough in the brain implant technology. This and more on Beyond World is One at these times.